Hi, Jason. Can you hear me? Ooh, let's just unmute you. Myself. There we go. Now I'm unmuted. Oh, Great. Excellent. Sorry with a little bit of time, but um, it's no okay. Worries. We can run on a little bit longer into the break after um, with Elizabeth's talk. So I'm just going to let you begin because uh, you're here to talk to us about our relationship with microbes. Yeah. So if I just share the screen here, let me just get this put together so I can share. Let's just make sure you all can see what I'm seeing. And can you see that? Uh, yes. Yes, we can. All righty. Uh, and I'm just going to do a very quick movement, right? That's good. You saw that? Yes. I did. Good. All right. So uh, I, I've given away the next slide, but that's fine. Uh, first off, uh, I want to say thank you very much for having me here. Um, I, I've been a fan of microbes. And as well, uh, I, I'm just so pleased that I'm being interviewed by Torment Giants Bane. So that just, I mean, he's my favorite character from Game of Thrones. So thank you so much, Torment. Well, thank um, you. <laughs> oh, and I'm still on. Yay. <laughs> okay, good. Um, so when we, uh, as you know, um, when it comes to microbes, when it comes to germs, uh, a lot of people may not be thinking that uh, we want to be doing any kind of relationship with them. And I mean, uh, all you have to do is look at people who happen to be germaphobic, much like Howie Mandel, to basically say, you know, you can't you can't be serious that I would want people to have a relationship with germs. And of course, this year, it's kind of gotten to a point where it's now uh, a, a little bit, um, I don't know, what's the word, um, toxic to even suggest that having a relationship with microbes is a good thing. However, one thing that we have to realize is that when we're actually talking about germs, we're not just simply talking about one or two different species. And if you actually look at this slide from 1979 to 2012, you know, the number of identified microbial species has been going up dramatically. And even since 2012, it's just been going up exponentially. We seem to be finding our way to understanding the diversity that exists out there. And more importantly, we're realizing how those numerous different species actually work with us as human beings. And what is really interesting is that a concept that was developed many, many, many years ago um, for just general ecology in general, which happens to be the idea of commensalism, mutualism, and parasitism. Now, commensalism happens to be, you kind of get along, everything's all right, nobody really notices one another. You got mutualism, and what this means is that there are people who are helping one another out, or in this particular case, conspecifics, if you're talking about ecology. And then there's parasitism, which essentially is pathogens. They're out to uh, live and survive off of you. So how does this relate to us as humans? Well, I think the best way to approach this is to take an example that we all can understand. Now, I'm in Canada, and our largest city happens to be Toronto. And if you were to look at Toronto, we have a population somewhere above 2.5 to 3 million, something along those lines. And when you look at the potential number of species that we have of microbes, um, essentially on Earth, that's about the same. So when we take a look at all of this, the majority of people, the majority of microbial species are commensal. They just go about their business. They don't really do anything. They don't say anything. Um, and, and they don't have very much impact on us. And that's fine. I mean, they just, it, it's good for people to just go about their business like we see here on this street. Um, by the way, this isn't a regular day in Toronto. This is actually during one of the parade routes. Uh, I believe it was the Pride Parade. and. Uh, uh, honestly, if you ever get to Toronto around uh, uh, Pride Month, and especially in Pride Week, you will have the best time of your life, guaranteed. Anyways, then we have um, essentially the mutualism. And these are the people, or in this case, the conspecifics, that are really aiming to improve our lives. And so we think about it from the perspective of who is in our world who's helping us. Well, I mean, to some extent, we have uh, law enforcement, and again, that's, that's debatable these days, but firefighters, absolutely. Teachers, you can never go wrong. Nurses, I mean, nurses are, are essentially the best thing for us. And of course, doctors, 
Um, oh, wait, sorry, wrong one. There we go, there's the doctor. Um, so the fact is that when we have these mutualism uh, candidates in species form, um, by getting close to them, it can actually help improve our lives. And then finally, we have the parasites. Uh, I mean, these are North American specific, but I'm sure that you have your own in uh, wherever you happen to be across the world. Uh, although I have to admit Thanos is definitely one of the worst villains across the universe, so I think we can all relate. Now, when we start talking about microbial species that possibly could have the same effect, well, then we're talking about something like Ebola. I mean, how many of us have heard about Ebola, what it can do? We now know about the epidemic that happened. It's one of the really nasty ones and we need to avoid it. And of course, we now have the coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, uh, COVID-19 is the disease. And so at that stage, you start thinking, okay, well, we really do need to avoid these. But the fact is, is how much of that should we actually be giving our attention? All right, how many of those species are there? And you know, when I give these talks in, in, uh, in lecture halls and schools and stuff, I always like to ask certain questions. And, and this one is very important. You know, how many species are out there that actually do harm humans? And if you happen to be a gambler based on what you're hearing out in the real world these days, you'd probably go at number three. But at the end of the day, the actual number is one, uh, 1,450. And, and out of that, there's really only about a dozen of those species that you yourself are ever gonna see, the sort of, sort of dirty dozen. The rest of them happen to be just good old fashioned microbes that we see under a microscope. And, and honestly, we've had such great microscopic imagery that we've seen over the course of this day. Um, if you haven't, I really recommend that after it's over, you go back and take a look. So when we first started seeing microbes under a microscope, um, it really was more along the lines of, oh, that's very interesting. I don't know what's really happening, but it's kind of cool. We hadn't yet made that link to uh, pathogens and, and to those that are harmful. And unfortunately, really didn't happen until something really bad occurred. And that was, we realized that certain types of bacteria were actually making our beer bad. They were spoiling our beer. And quite honestly, this means war. Because honestly, in Canada, if you, if you ruin our beer, we're going to go up against you. You're going to go down. And I'm sure that there are other places around the world that would agree with me. And the problem is, is that this idea of war against microbes, whether it be against beer, whether it be against human health, whether it be against the environment, it has really taken over the mindset of humanity. And so a number of years ago, uh, I was approached as what I'm still called now, the germ guy, to sort of find a way to change that perspective. Was there a way that I could develop not war, but peace, possibly even love with the microbes? And so I took upon my task uh, about seven or eight years ago, and eventually it came out in the form of the germ code, uh, which was a Canadian bestseller uh, and was also nominated for Best Science Book of the Year back in 2013. And, and essentially what had happened is, even though we, uh, the book says how to stop worrying and love the microbes, what it really came to be, as I found out, was sort of a discussion about our actual dysfunctional relationship with microbes. And so when we talk about relationships, it doesn't matter if you're talking about a rom-com, it doesn't really matter if you're talking about a novel, or just simply a talk like we're having today, there are three different acts that are involved. And the first act is always about how we set the stage for that dysfunction. And one of the best ways to approach it is just to say that when it comes to microbes, we really don't have much of a comparison as humans. And here's the easiest way of doing it. If you take a microbe and you give it the amount of unlimited amount of resources, all right, how long will it take before it covers the planet? And we're not just talking like one layer. We're talking about, you know, several layers so that when you step in it, it's goopy. Well, the answer to that is 36 hours. Yeah. Um, essentially, these things can multiply within 20 minutes for the most part. Sometimes they can be faster. A lot of times they're slower. But at the end of the day, if you give an E. coli, which is pictured here, Escherichia coli, um, a, a unlimited resources, and you give it unlimited space, 36 hours, it'll cover the planet. 
that's really hard for us to understand because even at 7 billion, we haven't even come close to being able to cover the planet entirely. What's even more interesting, and again, we've already seen some of these amazing talks. So I'm just going to highlight it. They can be found, these microbes, in some of the most incredibly extreme environments. And Ben, much like you were saying, it's kind of funny that, you know, the microbes that live here probably look at us and say, oh, you guys are extreme. How the heck can you live in these conditions? And it's absolutely fascinating that we can find them in areas where, you know, for the most part, we would think happen to be completely uninhabitable. And then, of course, we do have those pathogens like I was talking about. And I mean, I've got a couple of them listed here. Uh, we've got the noroviruses, the little blue dots. We've got Giardia, which looks really cool as a tattoo. I've got a few friends who have that as a tattoo. Um, we have uh, the, the, the nematodes that can do nasty things. And of course, we've got the bacterial species uh, up here. We've got in the middle Listeria. Uh, and, and of course, we've got... Um, uh, some of the gram negatives that are, are sharing their pili, and we'll get into that in a minute. So how do we get from a place where we essentially started off as being at war and get to a place where we feel like we're at peace? And in my research, what I found was that the best place happens to be a book that was written many, many, many years ago, Sun Tzu's The Art of War. And honestly, it's a very small book. I would, I would, really recommend that you pick it up, you read it, and you get a good feel. But when it comes to microbes, I've already done some of the work for you. So you want to know your potential enemies. You want to know what your weaknesses are. And I've already mentioned a few of them here. I mean, we, we only multiply about once every 20 years and compared to 20 minutes. Uh, we don't evolve anywhere near as fast as microbes in that case. Uh, we essentially um, are, are very large organisms that require certain types of conditions to stay alive. They can pretty much go anywhere and they'll evolve to do that. You want to know what your weapons are. And over time, we've actually figured out that we do have weapons against microbes, but the ones that we have been using may not necessarily be the best ones. You want to always act in a concerted way, and, and always that you know that's always a good thing. Um, I, I don't really have to go into that, but one that I really do want to bring up happens to be this idea of beware of lengthy campaigns, and this is one of those things where you start realizing um, even if we started the war on microbes back in 1912, which is one of the first times I've ever seen the term used, we haven't really gone very far. In fact. Anybody who may have actually believed that we have had a mission accomplished against microbes, especially the pathogens, uh, has been proven obviously uh, wrong. So the question then becomes, you know, what do we need to know in order for us to be able to find that harmony as opposed to the war? And even if we do happen to be having a war against those small number of pathogens, 450, uh, what are we going to do? Well, the first thing we need to realize is that you know, microbes can only get into us in a number of ways. We call these the portals of entry. Uh, and, and it's the five eyes, the inhalation, the ingestion, the ingress, the injury, uh, intimacy, intercourse. Um, that's really the only way that you can really get into a, a human body these days. And the fact of the matter is that if a microbe can get in there, well, what can end up happening is that you get a shift. And essentially, that shift can be what would normally be a nice, diverse environment comprised of microbes in some cases, maybe your cells, and, and eventually it gets to a point where you see that one entity coming in. I'm just going to highlight him here. And then over time, it's essentially going to develop to this. That's very dangerous. And one thing people have to understand is that no matter what you're talking about when it comes to commensalism, mutualism, and parasitism, if any kind of bacterial entity and even viral entity happens to get into your bloodstream, there's always a risk of this happening. They're not thinking per se. All of this is based on thermodynamics. All of this is based on the way that molecules interact with one another. And if you give microbes the opportunity to grow, they're going to grow. And if that comes at your expense, well, then that's really up to you. And I think one of the best examples of that happens to be one where uh, you've seen people do uh, surgeries in order to try and improve people's uh, 
improve people's lives, but inadvertently what ends up happening is that a microbe actually gets in there. And sometimes it doesn't even have to be a pathogen. It can be something as simple as a bacterium that's always on your skin called Staphylococcus epidermidis, and it can cause significant problems. So at the end of the day, what we have to realize is that we want to be sure that it's not getting inside of us. And if it's not getting inside of us, we're safe. But here's the problem. If we happen to have something that is pathogenic and has the capability of being able to spread, we have to figure out how it spreads and how fast it can spread. And we have a term for that. And it's called the r naught or the basic reproductive number. And essentially what this is telling us, um, despite all the math that you see here, is that we can be susceptible to an infection or some kind of colonization. We may be able to be recovered. In other words, we've seen it, we've moved on. Or we could be infected. And that means that we're currently in the process of dealing with this particular colonization. Now, again, we talk about this in the terms of pathogens, but this actually can happen in terms of a number of other possible entities. And one that happens to be really important in this particular case is a bacterium that we tend to see all the time, no matter where we go. It's called Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Now, the fact of the matter is that Pseudomonas really doesn't do a heck of a lot to most of us. But if it gets in your wounds, it can cause a major problem. And for those people who suffer from something like a cystic fibrosis, it can get into their lungs. So even if we're talking about regular average bacteria that normally are not considered to be pathogenic, it can lead to a problem of transmission and the basic reproductive number takes over. And what we see here is just how complicated it is when it comes to the idea of uh, an r naught. It's not something for you to read, not something for you to understand. We're not doing a final exam at the end of this, but it gives you an idea that this is not something that you do easily. And another thing that I also wanna point out is that during the COVID crisis that we've been going through, you probably heard numerous months ago this argument over uh, the reproductive number, uh, the R naught. What is it? Is it 2.5? Is it 3.5? Is it 15? You know what? At the end of the day, it's not really that big of a deal. And I'm gonna show you why. First off, though, I'm just going to show you a few of the r naughts for some of the diseases that we have out there. You'll actually notice that when it comes to measles, uh, which can be airborne, it's somewhere between 12 and 18. Um, for something like HIV AIDS, which of course is sexual contact, it's about 2 to 5. Uh, but, you know, we can do the r naught for practically anything. And a friend of mine out of the University of Ottawa uh, Robert Smith, question mark, you got to Google him, he's one of the best guys out there. He actually did something very similar, but it was for how fast um, Justin Bieber could transmit in terms of that fever that kids were having from person to person to person. What they found was that the actual r naught for that was 24. So the whole idea of a meme, something going viral, et cetera, et cetera, actually does have scientific validity and in some cases may actually be far larger than any of the transmissible organisms that we talk about. Now, when we talk about COVID-19, all right, we have to sort of take a look at that r naught with respect to others. So as we saw, you know, Ebola 1.6 to 2.0, COVID-19 2 to 2.5, MERS 2.5 to 7.2, okay? Here's the thing. The reason I say don't worry about that is because this is all situational based. Because when you start looking at Ebola, you actually realize that that 1.5 to 2.5 only exists if people are happening to be alive and interacting with one another. What we found in West Africa was that after death, that R naught went up to 12 to 13 because the virus didn't die, unfortunately, when someone did. And so without the proper burial protocols, and thankfully the WHO put those out there, um, we saw lots and lots of people getting infected. So again, when we start talking about being able to prevent these pathogens from getting into us, and not just the pathogens, we're talking about all those different types of organisms that potentially could cause a problem, you have to realize something. All the numbers in the world, the r naughts and all of the epidemiology that we're seeing, only relates to one particular factor at any given time. But if you want to start looking at a way of being able to forget about the, the threat and start looking at how you can have that relationship with them, then you need to start looking at behavior change. 
And one of the most important things that you need to realize is that we have to go into some dark areas of human behavior in order for us to be able to understand how we can start getting a better relationship with microbes. And another question that I tend to ask people happens to be this. What aspect of lifestyle has changed the most? In other words, how much has your life today changed from life two, three, four generations ago because of a, a bad germ or some kind of germ that has led to a problem, all right? And you might think eating habits. A lot of people tell me travel because that's the one thing that really has changed a lot. Uh, mass gatherings, Olympics, going to the Hodge. Um, but at the end of the day, the actual answer happens to be intimacy. And this is one of the things. A lot of people refuse to get into the idea of intimacy. However, if you actually look at the way that germs have affected or changed the way that we get close to one another, you actually notice that... Um, Thanks to syphilis, we, we got modest in the Middle Ages. Uh, gonorrhea led to the criminalization of prostitution. Uh, herpes changed the way that we looked at promiscuity. I mean, the whole idea, and I'm in North America, so you know, I, I was born a little bit too late for the, the love generation. But when herpes came around, all of a sudden the love generation kind of dropped off. HIV, uh, no glove, no love. I mean, the whole idea of using barrier protection became a norm. And then, of course, the human papilloma virus, which has what we call the Michael Douglas effect, because he came out and said something along the lines of intimate behavior actually led to him having a throat cancer based on a human papilloma virus. Of course, that was completely bogus. It was not true, but it did actually have an effect on how people started looking at uh, different ways of intimacy. So now that we've set the stage, we've got all these things put together. We understand what it is that we need to be looking out for in terms of that relationship, now we have to face the big challenge. And no matter what you're watching or, um, or reading, you know, the rom-coms, the, the novels, that type of thing, act two is always when everything gets blown out of proportion. And when it comes to our relationship with microbes, I like to call it the pandemic state of mind. Now, we are currently in the midst of COVID. So, most people would actually think that the state of mind of panic with respect to COVID is probably worthwhile. The thing is that when you start looking at our history, COVID is just one aspect of what we've gone through. And if you were to look at something a little bit more um, prominent in our history in order to understand how we've sort of misinterpreted um, microbes, you, you kind of need to go to uh, influenza, which is what you call, what, what you have here, and what I call the master of the germ code. And what this is doing is it's showing us that um, influenza is a very, very preventable illness. However, it always tends to come back, and usually it comes back every year, but every now and then we end up getting these, uh, these pandemics. Um, the most recent happened to be back in 2009, and one of the very interesting things about a pandemic is that it differs from an epidemic in the way that our social behavior takes us. Now, most of the time when you actually see a regular influenza virus and look at the dash line here, it really doesn't affect the majority of people. It's only those who happen to be very young and very old. But when you get into a pandemic, what ends up happening is that those middle ages from around 15 to 50, and when it comes to COVID, we're now looking at around 19 to 50, uh, you start to see a rise in the number of cases and also a rise in the number of severe cases and possibly deaths. Now, H1N1, the cause of the Spanish flu and even the flu from 2009, it was causing a lot more damage and death in these age groups than COVID is at the moment. And so when you hear people saying, well, it's no worse than the flu, or it's, no bad, you know, it's, it's not as bad as the flu, it does have some perspective to it. However, we are in the midst of a pandemic of a virus we've never seen before. So that makes it much more troublesome than the flu ever would be, because we just simply don't have that lasting partial or heterotypic immunity. So, it, it's an argument that a lot of people are having. What people are not arguing about, though, is this. Travel 
actually does have the opportunity to be able to change not the way we live, but the way that we interact with microbes. And when you actually start looking at the number of international tourist arrivals, you start to realize that, oh my goodness, you know, we had to somehow find a way to be able to stop the traveling before we ended up with something that could lead to a pandemic such as COVID. Unfortunately, that really didn't happen. And so what could have happened, which was on January 17th, when it was pretty much known in Wuhan that there could have been um, um, uh, that human transmissibility, they probably could have started the lockdown then. They didn't, they waited another four days. And with air travel, that was enough. And that's how it managed to spread across the world as we've seen here. But is that unique? No, because we saw the same thing with HIV. And, and, and I'm not talking about HIV with patient zero or patient O if you want, and, and that spreading. This was spreading around long beforehand. It's just, it was, it was unrecognized. It was just simply under the radar. And another one is the prevalence of measles. And this is very important, especially in North America, where we have a huge majority of the population who already happen to be uh, vaccinated. So they have protective immunity. But then you get somebody who doesn't have that protective immunity. They've never been vaccinated. They go to one of the hot spots, as you can probably see here, and then they travel back through air and then they bring it with them and other people end up getting infected. Um, normally, it doesn't really get much attention. Uh, but then a couple of years ago, it ended up in one of the Disneylands. Uh, it also ended up in state fairs. And all of a sudden, you start to really see how important that travel ends up becoming. So we've got intimacy, as I mentioned. We have travel. And now we have another factor, and that's brought on by this, which sort of is the epitome. Now, these are not loaves of bread. This is a uh, colored electron microscopic image of C. difficile. Now, we used to call it Clostridium difficile. It's now been called uh, Clostroides, um, and I'm pronouncing that horribly because I haven't memorized it yet, but C. difficile will work for now. And this actually is a major, major, major problem when it comes to uh, infections that essentially cannot be treated. Now, normally, Clostridium difficile would not have been a problem. However, it has developed what is known as antibiotic resistance. And if you're wondering how that happens, and the second part of the slide here will actually show you. Essentially, when we're treating different types of organisms, uh, we use antibiotics. But if we don't have a strong enough concentration, then what may end up happening is that the, uh, the Clostridium or, or C. difficile is going to uh, develop a, an evolution that's going to lead to the inability of that antibiotic to have an effect. Now, this isn't simple, something that's only with C. difficile. This actually happens with a large number of different types of organisms. And there's several different mechanisms that we now know of. So we could have efflux systems, inhibition systems. Uh, we could essentially inactivate whatever the drug happens to be. Um, all of these are now being seen. And another thing that's happening is that they're spreading from one particular bacterium to another. Now, when this is in a very small environment, yeah, okay, that happens, and, and very little we can do about that. But what we can do is we can actually stop the macro spread of antibiotics by essentially reducing their use in all sorts of different environments. Now, when it comes to um, humans, well, we can reduce the amount of antibiotics that are used when we're treating. When it comes to animals, well, we can use um, either um, drugs or treatments that have absolutely nothing to do with antibiotics. We can go natural if you want, or we can simply use drugs that are simply not seen or found within the human population, which is uh, one, of the, one of the directions that a lot of places are taking at the moment. Now, when you look at it from that perspective, now all of a sudden you're realizing that we're also going back to what we were seeing before with um, all sorts of different types of intimacies. The difference, of course, is that now we've gone from person-to-person -person intimacy inside of a bedroom to intimacy between people who we care about, in other words, close contacts. And now that leads us to a point where we start to realize that in everything that we do that happens to be close to another individual, we're risking the chance of having some kind of spread. And if we're not careful, then 
those types of bacteria and viruses, whether they happen to be, you know, parasitic, whether they happen to be uh, commensal, opportunistic, or quite simply, they just happen to be bacteria we're not particularly used to, can actually spread from one individual to another. So what's the answer in this case? Obviously, it seems like the answer would be you have to just simply stay away from one another, lock down and isolate yourselves. Of course, we've already tried that. And <laughs> I mean, how many of us are suffering from COVID fatigue, right? It's not particularly the best option. So what is the best way to be able to deal with this climax in the issue between us microbes and that relationship? And that takes us into Act 3, where we have to sort of find the love in all the right places. Now, before I get into some of the things that show that microbes really are good for us, the first thing I actually do want to tell you is that when it comes to the microbiome, which a lot of you probably want to be talking about, that's going to be in my next talk in about two hours. So we'll see you in the pro well, actually almost two hours exactly from now. As for what we can be doing with microbes to actually help us, we can use them to develop uh, medications or medicines. And if you actually look at Banting and Best, they actually created human insulin, um, and then eventually it became uh, something that could be done through the use of bacteria to be able to mass produce it. So in that sense, we can actually use bacteria to be able to help us develop medicines. We can also use bacteria to be able to develop uh, products that can be good for our health, but also possibly good for the environment. And in this particular case, uh, astaxanthin, which is a really, really good uh, supplement, can be made in algae. What's really funny, uh, and this was actually featured in um, a show called um, uh, Dirty Jobs uh, many, many years ago, was in order to get from that green to that red, you just simply had to make them angry. And the way you did that was you actually put them under sunlight. It's, it's a fascinating thing, and, and I would definitely recommend that you learn more about that. We can use uh, responsible genetic engineering, RGE. And what this means is that we can start developing uh, ways to be able to change our, our world, our environment, so that we can make things better. And so let's just say that people are deficient in a certain type of vitamin or maybe even omega-3 fatty acids. And we know that those can actually lead to chronic disease problems. We can actually use the bacteria to be able to help them, uh, help plants develop these particular types of uh, supplements. And when that happens, we can then start providing that to people in a way that will increase their nutritional um, I guess, safety, if you will, and prevent the likelihood of chronic, uh, chronic diseases, both uh, caused by bacteria as well, and viruses, um, as well as chronic ones, NCDs, non-communicable diseases. Um, the other thing is that germs actually do help the environment. So the more that we have them around, especially the ones that produce oxygen, the better off we're going to be. I know that we talk about trees and they're incredibly useful and necessary, but at the end of the day, algae and photoplankton are really the ones that are making up about 70% of the oxygen production on Earth. And uh, something that I had brought up a number of years ago was this idea of being able to uh, develop these um, almost monolithic uh, algae and phytoplankton uh, towers in the middle of the ocean where they can just essentially be oxygen pumpers. And this is something that has been looked at and is currently in development. Uh, finally, looking at how we can use bacteria to be able to, um, or even yeast and, uh, to be able to make ethanol. And this is very interesting because we're now at a situation where we are starting to look at how we can do a better job of being able to make these biofuels because that can actually take us out of the oil and gas industry. But at the same time, we have to do it in such a way that it balances out with our need for certain types of agricultural products, which would be the, the um, initial um, yield or substrate for, uh, for development of, of the ethanol. We're getting there. Um, for an example, the idea of using um, hops we use it for ma to make beer, um, but what we can do is take whatever's not used from the hops and put that in to make uh, cellulosic ethanol. So there are ways that we can approach this and actually improve our world. Um, so at the end of the day, what I want you to understand is that our relationship with microbes is pretty good. I don't want you to panic. 
But what I do want you to understand is that if you are panicking or if you are feeling like in a panic situation, it's okay. Because at the end of the day, as we go through that three act process, all right, we start to realize that it's going to take us some time to get from that despondency and depression at the end of act two, which is really where we are thanks to COVID and start getting back into hope and relief and optimism. And the idea behind that isn't necessarily um, having a vaccine or making sure that you wash your hands 30 times a day. Um, these are all going to be great in order to be able to help reduce the transmission. But at the same time, it's not going to give you the sense of, of, of confidence that we're going to be able to move forward in a way that is safe. Um, we need that behavior change. We need to start looking at our relationship with microbes in a way that we are getting away from the bad ones and we are welcoming in uh, the good ones. And that, you know, is, is sort of basically what trust is all about. So when you start talking about the germ code and our relationship with microbes, the first rule is the same rule that you see pretty much in all types of ecology, and that is eat and be eaten. Um, you know, microbes live by the pili and die by the pili. And if you happen to be in microbiology, you know what that means, and yay. Uh, otherwise, if you don't know what that means, essentially, it's all about being around uh, others. And then we evolve and adapt which is really important. And then we have all good things must come from your end. And then finally, germs are everywhere and get used to it, all right? And at the end of the day, even though you have to sort of take all of these into consideration, the one thing that you have to realize as we're moving forward is that the, the answer to the germ code, if I can get my screen back there, is to evolve and adapt. And if we adapt together, we're gonna to be able to have that relationship and find that love that we need. And I will thank you at the moment because we're now moving into the next segment. But I do want to say, if you're not going to come back for my second uh, talk, season two of my show, The Super Awesome Science Show, starts September 28th. And you can listen to season one right now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or wherever you get your streaming audio. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Jason. Now, I'm glad we've got you coming back again for a second talk. So that's been fantastic. Excellent. 